seven seat SUVs. You don't want one, you need one. So we've gathered the best selling models across three size classes, medium, large, and extra large, and we have crunched the numbers. That's right, we've crunched all those numbers, Suze, pricing and spec, value for money, interior space, usability, infotainment, the whole lot to find out the best way for you to spend your money wisely when you need to buy a seven seat SUV. This is the Drive Mega Test. Trent, not all seven seat SUVs are made the same. All the cars behind us have different price points, different powertrains, even different packaging. So what exactly are we looking for here today? Well, you touched on it there. It's about price points. Obviously, if you're buying a three row SUV because you need one, price is very important. So value for money is key, but we are crunching the numbers on absolutely everything with a focus on that third row, getting into it, usability, how easy it is to access, crucially important for any of these segments. With that in mind, we'll be breaking down the top performers across each criteria point, as well as calling out the winners in the medium, large and extra large categories and announcing the overall winner at the end of this video. It's time for another Drive Mega Test. Let's get into it. Our contenders are a blend of medium, large and extra large three row SUVs. Where possible, we looked for petrol all wheel drive variants, but some models were only available in front wheel drive while the Hyundai Santa Fe was only available with a diesel engine. Price-wise, we stuck to a loose guide of around $45,000 for medium SUVs, around $55,000 for large SUVs, and around $65,000 for extra-large SUVs. Representing the medium contingent is the Nissan X-Trail, Mitsubishi Outlander, Honda CRV, and Volkswagen Tiguan Allspace. Competing in the large category is the Hyundai Santa Fe, Kia Sorento, Mazda CX-8 and Skoda Kodiak. Finally, our extra-large contenders are the Hyundai Palisade, Mazda CX-9, Nissan Pathfinder and Toyota Kluger. It's no secret, we're facing a cost of living pinch at the moment. From buying everyday groceries to purchasing a vehicle to ferry the family, life is simply more expensive in 2023. In this seven-seat SUV mega test, we've evaluated all aspects in deciding the front runners, but we've paid particular attention to running costs. That is, the price you'll pay to own one of these vehicles ongoing. Of course, we've included the initial purchase price in our analysis, but it also goes much deeper than that, including things like insurance costs, resale value, warranty periods, and service pricing. Only after we've collated all of this data can we crown a winner. Let's get into some of the highlights. The Nissan X-Trail is a household name when it comes to family transport, and this latest generation has a lot to boast in terms of features, driving capability, and comfort levels. However, of the medium SUVs we have on test with us, it has the worst resale and is the most expensive on initial purchase price. It also uses 10,000 km service intervals, which equals more service visits in the long run, according to our average. Honda's new era is well known for its affordable service pricing at just $199 each visit. Its one price promise also means no haggling at the dealership. But service pricing is likely to increase after the first five visits and the insurance costs are very high. This is why it lags behind in its rivals in terms of ownership costs. Mitsubishi hangs its hat on a strong 10-year, 200,000 km warranty so long as you keep servicing your car at its wide-ranging network of service centres. This, plus the Mitsubishi's affordable purchase price, ensure the Outlander is among the most affordable seven-seat cars to own in this mega test. Volkswagen isn't always known for its affordable running costs, but the data doesn't lie, and the Tiguan is the best medium SUV in this test for ongoing running costs. Not only does it have an attractive entry price, but it also has a whopping nine years of roadside assistance. On the bad side, while it doesn't use a lot of fuel, it must be refueled with premium unleaded petrol. It was once our drive car of the year and remains one of the flashiest options within its size segment, but the Kia Sorento is pricey when it comes to insurance costs and fuel use. On the plus side, the Sorento offers a 7-year warranty and up to 8 years of roadside assistance. The Mazda CX-8 sits within the large SUV group at our 7-seat SUV mega test, where things get a little pricier. The Mazda might be one of the most expensive large SUVs to buy, but its service pricing is the most affordable and its insurance premium is fair. It also only requires regular unleaded fuel. The Skoda Kodiak starts out as the most affordable large SUV within its group, but that price quickly balloons with costly options packages. Our car as tested is $10,000 more than its list price. To its credit, the included warranty and roadside assistance programs are generous, 
but it does require premium unleaded petrol. While it's one of the older cars among its peers, the Hyundai Santa Fe packs a punch in the running cost stakes. The South Korean brand offers roadside assistance coverage for life, which is great, plus its fuel cost of over 15,000 kilometers is the cheapest of its size class. The Nissan Pathfinder is one of the brand's newest cars on sale, but it's also one of the most expensive cars to run in the entire mega test. This isn't helped by a big thirsty engine, nor is the three year retained value anything to boast about. Considering it's the second most expensive car in this comparison, budget savvy shoppers are better served elsewhere. The Mazda CX-9 is a long running large SUV nameplate, but the current generation is starting to age in this company. It annoyingly succumbs to 10,000 km service intervals, which mean you'll have to get it serviced more often if you drive up to 15,000 km per year. However, it remains affordable when it comes to resale value. It also comes with our expensive options packages as it's already well equipped. It's the most expensive car to buy on test and it's also one of the biggest, which means the Hyundai Palisades running costs are right up there amongst the most expensive. However, the 80% three-year retained value and generous roadside assistance coverage is welcome. The Toyota Kluger has long been an attractive option for seven-seat buyers on a budget. Its service costs are very affordable in comparison to rivals, while it's also the most frugal on fuel. Finally, Toyota's renowned resale values mean that this SUV could be worth more than it was new even after three years. Of course, the entire car industry is still experiencing supply shortages, which means any one of these SUVs could have significant wait times. Our best advice is to inquire with specific dealers to see how quickly you could get yourself into one of these cars. When purchasing a new car, you want to know that you're getting bang for your buck. So this means knowing what features come standard is important. We looked at each and every car with a fine tooth comb and used a point system to find out what features they have and what they miss out on. This means everything from wireless charge pads and seat heating to whether they accommodate the third row with things like air vents and the number of USB ports throughout. Now, all of these cars are fairly well equipped, so that means once you have a couple of crosses next to some items, you can quickly move your way down the list. And that's why some of these results are surprising. Kicking it off for the medium SUVs, this is the highest ranked, it's the Honda CRV. This might surprise you because when you jump in this car, no, it's not the most modern, it's certainly not the most attractive, but don't let that fool you. It's actually got plenty of kit. This car gets things like keyless entry, a wireless charge pad, heated front seats, and most importantly, it accommodates the third row, which a lot of them we found have not. So it's got your air vents. It also gets a full-size spare, and once we counted throughout this car, a mega 10 cup holders. The Mitsubishi Outlander still performed quite well. However, doesn't accommodate the third row with air vents, and unlike the CRV, it only gets a space saver spare tire, plus misses out on a flexible boot floor. It gained points when we counted other elements, such as cup holders, USB ports, and tie downs and hooks in the boot. This particular specification of the Tiguan doesn't get electric seats, seat heating, or ventilation, nor does it provide air vents for the third row. While the boot has a power tailgate, it only packs a space saver spare tire and misses out on underfloor storage and a flexible boot floor. You can tell that this is a really rough competition when you see that the Nissan X-Trail sits at the bottom of this group. It does well in terms of equipment, but it just misses out on some big details, including it doesn't have a power tailgate. This particular grade doesn't get rain sensing wipers. In the third row, they miss out on air vents, and it's also the only one in its group that goes without a wireless charge pad. But there are some positives. It got leather upholstery, heating for the front row, a power adjustable seat for the driver, and a luggage cover with storage compartment. The Kia Sorento has plenty of bells and whistles, and that's why it is ranked the highest among the large SUVs. Up the front, leather upholstered seats, they're also heated, ventilated, and electric. You get your wireless charge pad. The second and the third rows are really well accommodated as well. One thing to make mention of, there are eight USB ports throughout. There are 12 cup holders and this car has the most ISO fixed positions with four. The remaining large SUVs still have plenty of kit on offer, but as mentioned earlier, a few crosses next to some features and you quickly move down in the rankings. The Skoda Kodiak didn't do too badly at all with its count. In fact, this particular car is equipped with things such as electric front seats and three 12 volt plugs. But it gets across against things such as third row air vents and underfloor boot storage. The Hyundai Santa Fe didn't clock up as many points. 
It's the only car of the large SUVs that doesn't have electric front seats or retractable sun blinds. This grade also misses out on seat heating and ventilation in the front row, along with a power tailgate. It's really surprising to see that the Mazda CX-8 sits at the bottom of this pack. As you can see, it has leather upholstery. The front seats are electric, they're also heated. However, once you score a zero on a few of these elements, you quickly move all the way to the bottom of this list. It's very competitive. The Mazda unfortunately misses out on remote fold down releases. In the third row, it doesn't have air vents, therefore no climate control back there, no luggage cover, and it also only has a space saver spare wheel. The Nissan Pathfinder unfortunately sits at the bottom of the pack, even though it is still very well equipped and it accommodates all three rows really nicely. It does miss out though, however, for this grade on rain sensing wipers. You do get heated seats in the front, but they're not ventilated. The driver is electric, however, the passenger misses out and you don't get a luggage cover or a full size spare wheel. However, when we went through counting, it gets a mega 16 cup holders and also five USB ports throughout. The Hyundai Palisade would be a pretty hard car to compete against and that's because it ticks nearly every single box. This car is jam packed with standard niceties. In the front row, you're treated to your leather upholstered seats. They are heated and ventilated. In the second row, same thing, heated and ventilated seats. They're also reclining and the list goes on and on. It also accommodates the third row with their very own air vents. Every single passenger gets their own USB port. There are 16 cup holders, a power tailgate and a full size spare wheel. So it really has everything you could ask for and more in here, enough to keep all seven occupants very happy. And that's why it sits at the top of the group. So with tough competition, it's the little things that matter. For example, the Mazda CX-9, Toyota Kluger, and Nissan Pathfinder don't include seat heating and ventilation in the first and second rows, unlike the Palisade. Neither the CX-9 or Pathfinder have a full-size spare, while the Kluger is the only one in the group to go without retractable sunblinds in the second row, as well as wireless charging. It goes without saying that standard features are important. While something like seat heating might not be a deal breaker, things such as electric seats and leather upholstery may be high on a lot of people's wish list. When telling all of these up, some of the results are surprising, but where they lack in some areas, they make up for in others. If you're enjoying all the hard work the Drive team has put into this mega test, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that little bell icon so you're notified every time a new video goes live. When you're researching and buying your new car, chances are infotainment hasn't featured right up at the top of the list. But I can tell you, if you're going to own your car for five to seven years and you have to deal with that infotainment system every day, you want to make sure that it does exactly what you want it to do. Now, the judges have processed exactly that. Do these vehicles have digital radio? Do they have wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto? Do they have wireless charging? How easily does the system work? Does the screen work in any light? Is it an easy menu system to understand? The judges have broken all of that down. They've tested it all. They've crunched all those numbers and you can find that data specifically in this mega test, all broken down to make it easy to understand. Volkswagen Tiguan, we know it's a fantastic SUV, but the judges were really, really impressed with how you can interact with the infotainment system. Basically scored highly right across the board. Easy to use, you get wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, and perhaps most crucially, the steering wheel controls. They're clearly defined and they're really easy to use. Outlander's graphics aren't of the highest quality, but the icons are adequate and the system is easy enough to navigate through. It gets both wireless and wired Apple CarPlay, but Android Auto is wired only. X-Trail scored highly for its swift smartphone pairing capability, but the touchscreen in this grade is small, measuring in at only eight inches. And X-Trail doesn't include a head-up display. Now, to be fair to the CRV, one of the first places that any vehicle starts to feel old is right here inside the cabin. And there's no doubt against newer competition, the CRV is really starting to show its age. First up, 
a factor that the judges really didn't like, which I think is an issue, is the screen. It looks bigger than it is. If you have a look at it closely, the screen itself only takes up maybe just over half the actual available real estate. That's not great. And I think it's something that Honda would absolutely change for an update or an all new model. Uh, the fact that it's old means that's the way it used to be, but it doesn't have to stay that way, obviously. You do get wireless charging, but you don't get wireless car play. You don't get digital radio, and you don't get a head-up display either. Now, not just the fact that the screen is small. It's one of the most difficult to navigate in terms of working out what you're doing, and the graphics are a little bit old as well in terms of the interface and the way that you interact with it looks a little bit old. In isolation, it's not horrible, but up against competition that's so far advanced now, the CRV is undoubtedly starting to feel old. Large SUVs are getting to the point where they have the functionality, flexibility and interior space of an extra large SUV. And speaking of space, the screen real estate in this Kia Sorento is just about as good as it gets. It misses out on wireless Apple CarPlay, but it gets just about everything else. The judges loved it. They loved how easy the system is to use, and they loved the fact that the interaction with the screen is a lot more simple than it would be because of the size of the screen. There's so much more there to work with, makes it a lot easier to use when you're on the move, let alone when you're stationary. And overall, this is really well catered to for those family road trips or if you're driving around town. Mazda CX-8 gets a solid system and the placement of the screen is ideal for the driver's eye line with premium graphics. The screen is big too at 10.25 inches and you get both wireless and wired smartphone connectivity. The Skoda scored points for its functionality reacting quickly to inputs and it gets both wireless and wired Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Unfortunately, it misses out on digital radio and a head-up display. There's no doubt that something that seemed right up to date can seem like it's old hat very quickly, and that's the case with the Hyundai Santa Fe. The screen now feels quite small, and it is physically quite small, but it certainly feels that way compared to the best in the segment. There's no satellite navigation on this unit in this specification, so that's a point worth making. We had some connection issues and dropouts, especially with wireless Apple CarPlay, and effectively, just in general, the way this works, the graphics, the controls, it feels like an older system. That's why it struggles in this very competitive segment. So you've got an extra large SUV, and that probably means two things. You've got the family in tow, and you're spending a lot of time in it. So when you're loading up with the kids, with the family, and hitting the road, going on a road trip, you want as much functionality and practicality in here as you can get. This doesn't get wireless CarPlay, the Hyundai Palisade, but what it does get is just about everything else. It's scored really highly by the judges everywhere else. You also get a Hyundai Blue Link system, which means you can control certain functionality of the vehicles from the app on your phone. One of the key highlight points for us, speaking about families and road trips, is the passenger talk function, which means you can speak to people in the third row in the same voice as I'm doing right now. That means you don't have to yell. Mums and dads everywhere, rejoice. Kluger's new infotainment system, 12.3 inches, not only looks the business, but is easy to navigate through and it ticks most boxes, including wireless Apple CarPlay, wired Android Auto though, satellite navigation and a detailed trip computer. The touchscreen infotainment system in this Pathfinder grade is smaller than the best in segment at nine inches, but it does get wireless Apple CarPlay and wired Android Auto. Smartphone pairing and general usage is easy and the head-up display is excellent. The Mazda CX-9 is still a favourite in its segment, but the infotainment system, especially when it's compared to its sibling, the CX-8, is starting to feel like it needs an update. It doesn't get wireless CarPlay, the CX-8 does, and the other factor that starts to get a little bit grating when you compare this system to all of the others that we're doing in this Comparo is that it's only a touch screen when you are stationary. So you have to use the rotary dial down here to control the system. You do get used to it and it's solid and it works, but to be fair, we're comparing it right here in this comparison against other units that are touch screen and work particularly well. The fact that it's getting older in both look and design and that it's low on extra features in comparison to the others in this segment means that the CX-9 really now does need an update. 
In the medium SUV segment, it was the Volkswagen Tiguan Allspace that had the most impressive overall infotainment system, and that held up well in the overall rankings, with the Tiguan Allspace coming in fifth. But the winner in the infotainment segment overall was the Hyundai Palisade Highlander, followed closely by the Toyota Kluga, and then the Kia Sorento in third. With seven-seaters, it's all about the space race. Which vehicle has the most room for the larger Australian families? Not just in the first and second row, but also in the equally important third row where usable space can make or break. The easy answer is buy an extra large SUV, but what if you don't want to drive such a big vehicle every day? Or what if your budget doesn't stretch beyond 55 grand? What are the benefits of buying a smaller seven-seat SUV? And what are the compromises? That's what we set out to discover when we brought together 12 SUVs from three different size classes. We've measured every space these 12 cars have to find which ones are bigger where it matters most and which ones offer great space at a fair price. Volkswagen calls it the all space and it has more space than any other seven seat medium SUV. Loads of headroom in the first and second rows plus plenty of legroom in the third row are the highlights. However, a high floor in the third row will compromise comfort for taller kids. Now, newness doesn't always equal spaciousness, but in the case of this Nissan X-Trail, the most recent arrival in Australia of all 12 cars on test, it does. While it's not as big as the class-leading Volkswagen Tiguan Allspace, it's still plenty roomy enough to handle a busy young family or a couple of teenagers. This second row, for example, is cavernous, and the third row, decent luggage space, also the lowest loading height of all cars here. Now one other thing worth mentioning is that the second row doors open the widest to a full 90 degrees, making this car the easiest to get into in the second row. Mitsubishi's otherwise impressive Outlander is not a strong competitor in the space race. It's surprisingly narrow despite decent external dimensions and a high second row seat eats into headroom. The boot is also less generous than its rivals in each of the three main seating configurations. Now, while we can agree that newness doesn't always equal spaciousness, the Nissan X-Trail does follow that logic. So it kind of makes sense, I guess, that the Honda CR-V, the oldest of the 12 cars here, is also the least spacious, or to put it another way, the most cramped. Its second row is far from good, and the third row, as you can see, it's a pre-teenager's domain at best. Cargo space is also one of the least efficient. Now this is not just my opinion, we took 22 measurements on every one of the 12 cars here. The data proves it out, the CRV is the least spacious. And if you wanna see that data, or indeed read about any of the stuff we've covered in this video, check out drive.com.au and it's all there. If Skoda set occupant comfort as a target, then it absolutely nailed the bullseye with the Kodiak with the best overall combination of headroom, legroom, and underseat footroom in the second and third rows. Unfortunately, vehicle width is a weakness with the Skoda's elbow room among the tightest on test. The Mazda CX-8 puts up a good fight, but it can't match the Skoda overall. Even though it has one of the smaller front rows, the second row is quite wide and also has really good legroom. The third row is decent as well. The one area it's struggled is in the boot, where its floor to roof ratio is one of the lowest. In a world of winners and losers, the Santa Fe occupies the absolute middle ground, neither excelling nor embarrassing in any measurable way. The only weakness is headroom in that second row middle seat, but that's because of heavier sculpting in the outboard seats, which makes them more comfortable during driving. It does have one of the more decent front rows for space, but the second row is a bit lacking, particularly in knee room and headroom, and the third row, well, for secondary students and above, it's not the most comfortable. The Kia Sorento's second and third rows are the least spacious of our four large SUVs, but it does have the widest cabin in its class, which means three adults in the second row isn't as squeezy. The new Pathfinder looks big because it is big. It topped our charts for occupant space in the first, second and third rows and has one of the most generous boots to boot. One area where it was unbeaten was in terms of elbow room in all three rows, which is great if you've got a broad-shouldered family or a bunch of rugby players in your offspring. Toyota seemingly never strives to be the best at any one thing. It just wants to deliver a compelling overall package. Interior space is a perfect example. The Kluger is not the biggest, but it is big enough to live with. The second row under delivers though against its rivals, but the third row has more room than most, although thigh support is compromised by a low seat and a high floor. 
If you want the widest car for three adults in the middle row, the Palisade is your man. It also has the most generous third row and the biggest boot, with a commendably low load height to make getting heavy suitcases up and in as easy as possible. Mazda's stylish people mover is all about the second row. It has the best combination of headroom and legroom in our group, but that sleekish roofline does compromise third row headroom and cargo height. It's probably no surprise, but it is something of a validation to learn that the overall rankings fell into line with the category sizes. All the upper large SUVs had more usable space than the large SUVs, which in turn outspace raced the medium SUVs. That means that even the most cramped car in a larger category is still roomier than the best of the category below. So consumers can rest assured that stepping up a class comes with space benefits, and likewise, stepping down a class will yield a more compact cabin. This wouldn't be a seven seat SUV mega test without getting in a few third rows. So the team has gracefully chosen me, all six foot four and 194 centimeters. So let's get into it now and see how they all fare. The Hyundai Palisade is the outright best, obviously because it's the biggest car here, but also because of the range of seat movement is huge. It's a low floor to step into and there's a wide aperture to get into that third row. The Mitsubishi Outlander is a bit compromised because the seat doesn't slide far enough forward. This means it's difficult to get your feet in specifically. In addition, it's also a heavy seat to slide forward. The Mazda CX-9 has both a latch and a button to slide the entire seat forward. But because the seats are so chunky, it limits absolute space to squeeze through. Even still, there's a good gap to get inside that third row and a low floor too. The Kia Sorento has a one-touch button to slide the entire seat forward. It leaves a big gap to slide through to make it as easy as possible to scoot inside the third row. It's also not a particularly heavy seat to slide back. The Nissan X-Trail uses a latch instead of a one-touch button to slide into that third row. It also doesn't leave a big enough gap to squeeze through. The Hyundai Santa Fe has a handy button to fold and slide the entire seat forward, though the aperture for occupants to get through is small considering the car's outright size. The Skoda Kodiak has a latch to fold the seat back forward, but you have to slide the seat forward yourself. The aperture to slide through is decent for an adult. Nissan's Pathfinder has a button to shift the entire seat forward and it really moves the entire seat out of the way. Access is one of the best because of this. The Volkswagen Tiguan uses a latch to fold the seat forward like its Skoda relative. While there's a decent gap to squeeze through, the seat is quite heavy to manoeuvre. The Mazda CX-8 is similar to the CX-9 in that it has both a latch and a button to slide the entire seat forward but its outright dimensions are that much smaller than the Mazda CX-9 which makes it slightly more difficult to slide into that third row. The Toyota Kluge has a latch to fold the seats forward and you can slide the seat out of the way for a sizable space to squeeze through. It's a relatively light action and one that even kids could handle without much fuss. The Honda CRV seats are some of the most frustrating to use on the Mega Test. The second row has to fold flat before it can topple forward. This is an unnecessary step which can be plain annoying in a hurry. On the road, judges looked for cars that were comfortable over a variety of urban road surfaces, easy to manoeuvre, quiet in the cabin and gutsy enough to tackle a fully loaded family road trip. Our 12 contenders were rigorously assessed over a drive loop that contained everything from school zones to train tracks and potholes to four lane freeways, and we identified a few clear standouts. Put simply, the Skoda Kodiak is a large SUV we love to drive, and that is quite a rare feat in this class. Typically, the best you can get is that it's manageable around town, but this car actually has a serious amount of fun factor. It's punchy and agile. It's really at home zipping around little corners in city streets, as well as overtaking on the freeway. We found that it has a really nice blend of comfort and refinement without sacrificing any of that dynamic flair. And really, we could just be driving it all day and never get sick of it. So that's why we crowned it the winner of our driving category. The Nissan X-Trail was the best performing medium SUV in the driving category, and it also placed second overall in the driving category as well. And that's because we feel like it's a fantastic all-rounder. It's not a particular standout in any one area, but it does a lot of things really well. Some call-outs are that it's a nice, quiet cabin, it rides well and is super comfortable. It's also a really easy footprint to live with around town with a lovely light steering feel and good visibility all-round. 
In short, it's just a really easy car to get in and go and we think it will suit the lifestyles of all growing families and all different needs. So whether you're driving around town or at freeway speeds, the X-Trail will be up to the job. One of the big things that surprised our judges, ironically, is the fact that while it's one of the extra large SUVs, the Pathfinder doesn't actually feel extra large on the road. It's kind of got a, I guess, a surprising crispness to its handling. So it feels hardly sports car-like, but a lot more passenger car-like and a lot more compact than it actually is. Turns in really nicely, but at the same time, it stays comfortable, it stays flat, and it stays measured. Ultimately, this means that parking and manoeuvring in tight streets gets a lot easier, and that takes a lot of heat out of owning an SUV this big. Digging beneath the surface a little bit, while it may not be something that matters to average family car buyers, looking at the platform for the Pathfinder, it's actually a generation older than some of the other cars here. Nissan has reused this from the previous generation Pathfinder. So, even though this is a car with old bones, it has a fresh feel, and that really stood out to us. So, it puts the Pathfinder at the top of its peers in the extra large class as the driver's pick. Not that it might be what you're after in an extra large SUV, but it definitely puts a smile on your face every time you get in. Sitting between the top and bottom contenders were cars like the Volkswagen Tiguan Allspace, which ranked equal third with the Nissan Pathfinder, thanks to its polished and engaging on-road feel, but showed some hesitation from the dual clutch transmission at low speeds. Meanwhile, the Mazda CX-9 came in fifth overall, despite being one of the older cars on test, thanks to its focus on refinement and dynamics and an impeccably quiet cabin, but lost points over its limited visibility, particularly at the rear. Coming in sixth was the Toyota Kluger, which was easily the most comfortable car on test, thanks to a superbly soft ride and quiet cabin. But the trade-off is a wobbly feel over bumps and less alert handling. Much like its CX-9 sibling, the updated Mazda CX-8 scored well for its excellent refinement and body control, but fell to seventh place for its firmer ride and slight lack of power above city speeds. The Mitsubishi Outlander took eighth place as a sturdy, capable jack-of-all-trades that performed consistently across all criteria, but lacked polish in its execution and felt less upmarket than some of its rivals. In ninth spot, the Kia Sorento offered strong visibility and solid comfort around town, but judges were aware of its size going into corners and noticed more noise seeping into the cabin at freeway speeds. The Sorento safety systems were also deemed a touch too enthusiastic. While all contenders were solid and reliable on the road, some cars fell at the bottom of the pile for offering an overly wobbly ride quality, imprecise steering, annoying safety systems, a lack of refinement or lacklustre performance. Now among the SUVs in our medium group, the CRV didn't fare too well, but there's probably a good reason for that. When we last tested the CRV in a mega test, it was our medium SUV mega test last year, we'd assumed that by now there'd be a new generation vehicle to test. However, that isn't the case. If you walk into a dealership, this is the CRV you will buy. And as a result, it kind of doesn't hide its age that well. As we were driving around, we found that the engine feels a little bit lackluster. This is a car that struggles with its weight. And when you couple that with a CVT transmission that just isn't quite as alert as some of the other gearboxes on test here, it makes it a bit of a slug around town and it doesn't cope that well with changing traffic conditions. Now, it's not all bad news. When it comes to things like ride comfort and insulation, CRV actually does a pretty good job. It's unfussed by things like speed humps and you really won't notice it for things like the school drop-off and the commute doing anything that's particularly awful. It's just that it doesn't do them quite as well as cars that are a little bit newer and a little bit more polished. Now the Palisade offers a few touches that are really quite likable. It has a silky smooth V6 and its automatic transmission is easy to forget about, but it also brings some downsides. It is a big car, it's one of the biggest ones here and it kind of feels like that on the road. It's wallowy and it's a little bit cumbersome. It just doesn't quite have the togetherness of the other extra large SUVs that we drove. You will like the space, but you will also have to deal with the fact that that makes it harder to park and harder to fit into 
small driveways and narrow laneways. You'll like that it's quiet, but you may not like that it can be both sluggish when you ask it to perform, yet weirdly it suffers from some traction issues. So if you're taking off from a standstill on anything other than a perfectly dry sealed surface, you'll get plenty of spin from the front wheels and perhaps not the kind of behavior that you'd ultimately like. Now, that all sounds pretty dire, but we're talking about some small gaps between what we consider the best and what finished in last place. Among the extra large SUVs, this is the one that shone the least, but it certainly won't leave you feeling like you've made a terrible decision if you decide the Palisade is the one that's right for you. Unfortunately, the Hyundai Santa Fe ranked last in our driving test, which also means it was the worst performing large SUV in the driving category. It's worth noting this is a diesel car, so despite our best efforts to get mostly get petrol cars, this is a diesel, which could explain why it felt a little bit out of its depth around town. It is comfortable enough and pretty easy to maneuver, it's just lacking on refinement. So it has a transmission that felt a little bit unpolished at low speeds and a ride that really felt like it was easily thrown off kilter over uneven surfaces. According to our final scores, the medium SUV that offers the best on-road performance is the Nissan X-Trail, our pick for best all-rounder. For the large category, our favourite to drive was the Skoda Kodiak. Of the extra large SUVs, the winner of the driving category was the Nissan Pathfinder, followed by the Mazda CX-9, the Toyota Kluger and the Hyundai Palisade. As mentioned, the dynamic Skoda Kodiak was our overall winner in the driving category, followed by the versatile Nissan X-Trail in second place, and the Nissan Pathfinder and Volkswagen Tiguan Allspace in equal third place. If you have a growing family, chances are you also have a newfound appreciation for safety technology, not just for yourself in the front row, but all the way to the third row as well. In recent years, three row SUVs have gained a whole host of new and innovative features to help protect you and your family. From an alert that lets you know if you're about to open your door into oncoming traffic, to a warning that sounds if you might have left someone behind in the rear seats. Of course, in assessing safety, we also looked at the essentials, like whether or not the model has a recent five star safety safety rating from ANCAP and whether or not the curtain airbags extend all the way to cover the third row. The results were vast and varied, so let's get into the details. In first place for safety was the Hyundai Palisade thanks to its advanced autonomous emergency braking system, recent five-star score from ANCAP and numerous active safety features. It also boasted handy extras like a digital rear view mirror and a safe exit alert. The Kia Sorento was close behind the Palisade in second place with a blind spot view monitor that provides a video feed direct to the driver and a 360 degree camera, but curtain airbags that don't provide coverage to the third row. In third place was the Nissan Pathfinder, one of the newer models on our test. It features modern conveniences like rear automatic braking, traffic sign recognition and autonomous emergency braking with junction assist. Ranking in fourth place was the Nissan X-Trail, which shares much of the same safety equipment as the Pathfinder. The only major difference to note is that while the Pathfinder's curtain airbags cover the third row, the X-Trails do not. The Toyota Kluger placed fifth with no tyre pressure monitor or surround view monitor, but most other safety essentials like curtain airbags to the third row, traffic sign recognition and a driver monitoring system. The Mitsubishi Outlander and the Hyundai Santa Fe jointly claim sixth place. The Outlander offers a solid amount of standard safety equipment, but some features are only available on higher specification grades. Some notable absences include a tyre pressure monitoring system, no curtain airbag coverage for the third row, and no stop and go functionality for the active cruise control. Meanwhile, the Hyundai Santa Fe provides active lane keeping, an active rear cross traffic alert, an advanced front and rear autonomous emergency braking, a lax a surround view camera, speed limit awareness and a full curtain airbag coverage for the third row. Coincidentally, the Mazda CX-8 and CX-9 claimed 8th and 9th place respectively in the safety category. As the more recently updated of the pair, the CX-8 sat two points higher than the CX-9 for having a more recent ANCAP safety rating, but otherwise the two shared much of the same equipment. Sharing ninth place with the Mazda CX-9 was the Honda CRV, 
which offers basic versions of most safety systems but misses out on speed limit awareness and blind spot monitoring. It does, however, offer what's called Lane Watch, which shows a camera view of the side of your car when indicating. In 11th place, the Skoda Kodiak also misses out on blind spot monitoring as standard, as well as a rear cross traffic alert, but this is set to be remedied by a model year update that will have taken effect by the time of publishing. The Volkswagen Tiguan Allspace came in last in the safety category for missing out on blind spot monitoring and a rear cross traffic alert due to semiconductor shortages, as well as foregoing speed limit awareness and having an expired ANCAP safety rating. For the full breakdown of safety scores, head to drive.com.au. When we tallied up the six category scores, we set our priorities along family lines. Safety and ownership costs are two areas that are non-negotiables for Australian families, so we gave them the most weight. We also placed a higher importance on interior dimensions and features. That leaves infotainment and driving dynamics, which are still important disciplines, but less so than the other four. After we applied those priorities, the true winners emerged. Well, three different winners, Suze, in three really interesting segments in this SUV mega test. Exactly. I will skip the fanfare and get straight to the winners because that's what we're all here for. For our medium SUV, we have crowned the Nissan X-Trail. For our large SUV, we have crowned the Kia Sorento. And for our upper large SUV, we have crowned what's behind us, the Hyundai Palisade. So let's break down their winning scores. The Nissan X-Trail is the best seven-seat medium SUV for urban families who want practicality and flexibility in a comparatively compact car. It has class-leading safety, decent space, solid driving dynamics and is affordable to run. Nissan could make the X-Trail STL even more compelling by improving the equipment list and upgrading to a classier infotainment system like the one fitted to more expensive X-Trail variants. But still, those are nice-to-haves, not need-to-haves. The Kia Sorento stole the win from the Skoda Kodiak with large SUV class leading safety features, a long list of interior equipment and one of the best infotainment systems in the business. The Sorento wasn't quite the equal of the Skoda for interior space, but it has enough to do the job. The Sorento's only real weakness is running costs. That petrol V6 is thirsty, but we'd recommend buyers look at the economical diesel instead. In our upper large class, the Hyundai Palisade came out ahead of the popular Toyota Kluger because it has a better safety suite, more interior space, and a peerless standard equipment list, all of which makes it an uncompromising family truckster. The Kluger is easier on the hip pocket, sure, it has a more affordable servicing schedule, is cheaper to fuel, and has an unbeatable resale value down the track, but none of those help you move your family in more comfort every day. If that's what you want, and it is what we were looking for, then the Hyundai Palisade ticks all the right boxes. Well, Suze, there can only be one winner in this, let's say, eclectic seven-seat SUV mega test. <laughs> That's right. This car, the Hyundai Palisade, was our top-rated vehicle for infotainment, equipment and safety, and it also performed very well in the interior dimensions category. That's right. Strong across the board. Let's take a closer look at why the judges liked this vehicle as much as they did and how the cream rose to the top. The Hyundai Palisade is as close to a people mover in SUV clothes as it gets. The Palisade topped the rankings in three of the six categories, namely safety, interior equipment and infotainment, and came in second in interior space, all the heartland disciplines for family vehicles. If the Palisade has a weakness, it's ownership costs, which is understandable given it is the most expensive vehicle in our comparison. A car of this price is not cheap to insure and not easy on fuel. We'd strongly encourage you to consider the slightly more expensive diesel powertrain, which is more economical and more suited to a family hauler. One of the questions we posed ourselves at the start was, does stepping up in vehicle class size actually bring tangible benefits? In other words, is bigger actually better? The answer is yes. We saw benefits in all the areas that count, but we also discovered that driving dynamics and running costs are impacted, so bear that in mind. The team put plenty of work into this seven seat SUV mega test and we just hope that you enjoyed watching it as much as we enjoyed making it. For a full written breakdown of all the categories plus how each car performed in their own scoring, head to drive.com.au now. As always, if you like this video, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that bell icon so you're notified every time a new video goes live. Thanks for watching.